So first of all, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to this uh, presentation. Uh, and as Max said, today I'm going to talk about uh, B2B and how this can uh, improve your uh, search and discovery experience. But um, before I do that, let's first start with a short overview of how commerce is uh, done today. Um, if you are a brand or a merchant uh, and you want to sell your products online, you basically have three options. One, you can build your own web shop. Two, you can sell in the marketplace, for example, Amazon. Or you can sell directly through uh, social platforms like Facebook and, and Instagram. But in almost all markets, it's, it's the marketplace option that's, that's in charge. And the reason for this is that they are very good at matching offer and demand. However, the, the, this benefit of, uh, com, comes at a cost. Um, first of all, a lot of data is being collected, both from the supplier and from the customer. And also, the, the marketplace owns the whole customer experience. So it takes away the opportunity from the, from the retailer to build a sustainable relationship with, with our customers. And in addition, uh, especially in e-commerce, uh, retailers face a challenge that the platform itself is also a competitor, but they have the advantage of having uh, more data and they don't have to pay commission fees. Um, so let's dig a little deep, uh, let's dig a little deeper into this. Um, in, in, in online commerce, the, the challenge has always been to, to help people by, by understanding them because the better you understand what people want, the better you can adjust your offering. And this is also what we do at Empathy every day. We try to understand what people are looking for and then help them to discover new things. Unfortunately, this notion of understanding has been uh, translated by, by many into a practice of, of following and, and tracking every step that we take online. Um, and, and the idea behind this, of course, is that the more you know about someone, the better you can understand and predict this behavior. But as you understand, this approach affects our privacy. And, and in our opinion, it's also not the most effective way to provide people with, with relevant content, because what, what makes people click is not necessarily in, in their best interest. So today, uh, I want to talk about a different approach towards understanding, uh, one where instead of relying on data collection, we will rely on information that people are willing to share with us. And we will look at the opportunities that this enables and the value that is created, both for the end user and as well as for the, for the business. Um, and also, I will talk a little bit about the challenges that we foresee in this approach and then some possible solutions. Let's, let's first look at the, at the context, because the better we understand uh, the world around us, the, the more effective we can act on it. And looking at the context of, of, of data uh, collection, there are three noticeable uh, developments. And first of all, there's a declining trust in, in big tech. So when companies like Facebook and Amazon, when they started to grow, initially, Everybody was very positive. They came with, with great services, uh, great products, which were uh, very cheap or often even uh, for free. But in the last couple of years, this, this attitude is, is changing. And we, and we now start to see the effects of having a, a very small group of companies uh, that, uh, that has so much information about us that they can now willingly or unwillingly influence how we interact with each other. I think, for example, about uh, false information that is spread around elections or uh, about the coronavirus, but, but also algorithms that are designed to keep us engaged that are now promoting extreme content. And it's not that these companies intended these interactions to happen. It's rather that they don't know how to, how to deal with them. And of course, as an end user, as a customer, I have no idea what information they have on me and, and how they are using it. The second development, uh, which I think is worth mentioning, is uh, regulation, which is, of course, a, lo uh, a logical result of the first one. So here in Europe, we have the, the GDPR, which says uh, which data we can collect and under what circumstances. And one of the results of, this re of these regulations is that it now becomes a liability to have so much data. Because, for example, if there's a breach in your database, you are the one responsible, but also just having the data, but without the right consent, um, uh, makes you liable for, for a fine. And the third 
development uh, we're highlighting here, uh, which in my opinion is, is, is the most interesting, is, is Big Tech's own reaction to these previous two developments. Look, for example, at uh, Apple's uh, latest iOS updates, which now uh, tells every business or every app builder uh, now has to uh, explicitly ask for permission to, to track somebody. Uh, but also companies like uh, Google, that, uh, which, which is known for, for collecting and generating uh, lots of data. Even Google is now saying we're, we're going to block third party uh, cookies in, in, in our Chrome browser. Now, of course, you could question the motivation of, the, of these companies, and I think we, we should. But regardless of that, uh, their decisions have a great impact on, on how companies will, will run their business. So these developments bring, uh, of course, many challenges, uh, and it forces us to take uh, a position on how we are going to deal with these changes. So next, I would like to share with you two scenarios, one where we uh, don't act on this, on this changing uh, world, and one where we do. So let's start with don't act. And when I say don't act, I don't mean we don't do anything at all, but rather it means that uh, the focus is on complying. So we stay with our conventional way of thinking and try to see what's possible within the limitations that are set by these regulations like GDPR, but also the limitations imposed by companies like Google and Apple. Um, because I believe there will always, even with these changes, there will always be ways to, to collect customer data. And, and, and regulation don't, don't dictate that no data can be collected at all. But it does mean that over time, less data will be uh, at our disposal. And let's look at the other scenario. Uh, and this one I call ACT. And, and here, we assume that we uh, embrace this, this changing world. Um, and in, in this scenario, we assume that we, we don't get any data. And instead, uh, information always stays with, with the customer. And uh, data that's generated by interacting with your business is handed back to the customer as well, so it can be used in other situations. And in our conventional way of thinking, this sounds counterintuitive, because not only would you give away a valuable asset that is this data, you also would allow people to then take this data that, that they've created with you and then take it somewhere else, even to a competitor. So it, it, it feels a little bit uh, strange. But let's have a look at what you can get in return for this. Um, and there are four things, I think. Uh, first thing is trust. If you say to your customer, here's the data that we've generated, but it's yours, use it however you want it, it creates trust. The second thing is that the information can become uh, much richer because if the end user controls all their data, uh, and they control, they have data from different sources, this information can then be combined and, and, and then used to create a more holistic view of this, of this user. And third, the data is more accurate because the end user will take more care of the information, make sure that it's up to date. And finally, it can lead to more access to data and because the more control someone has over their information, the more willing they are, shared, uh, they are, yeah, the more willing they are to share this information. And this is what some call the control paradox. Um, and it's important to understand that also in this second scenario of, of embracing, uh, there's still room for, for, uh, for collecting some data and, and, and performing analytics on how users interact with your service or, or with your shop. But a clear distinction is made in what data belongs to the customer and what doesn't belong to the business. And in some cases, information belongs to both parties. Now, we believe that this opens up new possibilities. But for this to happen, not only must people be able to own their data, they must also uh, be able to provide access to this information. And here, decentralization comes into play. Now, what do we mean with decentralization? Um, instead of storing uh, user information into a central system, for example, a CRM tool, customers uh, now have their own private space. And this can be a private server, or a local storage like your mobile phone. And in this case, the, the, the user becomes the, the controller of their information and the business can act as a processor. 
Now, already a lot is going on uh, in, in the space. Uh, I uh, highlighted here some of the initiatives that are working on, on, on what is called, uh, what many call pods, like personal data storages, uh, for example, uh, Citizen and Me, uh, the Hub of All Things, uh, and Solid. And we now start to see that, that these initiatives are, are um, being picked up by um, um, by more companies and, and even governments. For example, uh, Solid is doing a pilot in Belgium where, where citizens in a certain region uh, get, uh, get a pot to interact with, uh, with our, our local government. Um, and we at Empathy, we too are exploring this, uh, this space, but, but we, we keep the focus on, on commerce. Uh, and we, we are looking at how this uh, way of, of decentralization can improve the, the, the experience of search and, and, and discovery. Um, and when it comes to, to commerce, uh, we believe that this enables a new way of conducting business. And, and this is a way of from going of going from B to C to, to me to B. Uh, and I will explain that uh, now. So in traditional online commerce, uh, customers connect to brands, often by creating an account, which can then be used to optimize the, the customer experience. If we look at me to B, however, we turn things around and we allow brands to connect to the customer. And here um, they can request access to the information from the user to optimize the experience uh, for, a sh for a shop or a service. Now, today we aren't there yet, but, but we dedicate a lot of our time to explore the new possibilities that are enabled when we embrace this, uh, this change. So I would like to show some of the initi initiatives that we are, we are working on. Um, and the way I'm going to do this is by walking you through uh, the customer experience as we uh, uh, envision this. Uh, and please note that uh, even though we are already experimenting with, with some of the solutions uh, proposed here, and, and nothing is uh, said as soon, so, so any feedback that you uh, might have is, is, is more than welcome. So let's get started. Um, it all starts with a pod, and, and this is, as mentioned, the environment where uh, that's owned by the by the user, and it's, it's where all the data lives. Uh, whether it's information provided by the user or data generated by interacting with a shop or a service, and, and we consider the pod as a, as a tool for people to express themselves uh, digitally. And in a me to be environment, this is key because, unlike uh, uh, traditional uh, marketplaces and traditional commerce, the focus where the focus is on uh, transactions, we focus on building relationships which in the long run creates more value for both the merchant and the customer. And similar to relationships between humans, these relationships, they, they can start uh, and they can grow and sometimes they, they come to an end. So how do we engage in these relationships? Yeah, oh, sorry, there seems to be a delay. Yeah, apologies. Um, so we, we start these relationships by, by connecting to a brand. And, and like when you meet a person uh, in real life for the first time, you usually don't pour out your heart directly. Instead, you, you slowly engage and see what the other has to offer. And here with brands, you want to f first get to know the brand. Uh, but as there's little information at this point, and, and there's also little trust, um, we would like to give the, the, the user the, the opportunity to uh, engage with the brand, but without revealing too much information or any information at all. And one way that we are now trying to solve this is, is through feeds. A feed is uh, a, a, a stream of information that uh, a customer can uh, subscribe to. Uh, and information can then be sent directly from the brand to the part of the customer. And at this point, the, 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 the customer or the visitor doesn't have to share any information, unlike, for example, with a newsletter. Uh, when you, if you subscribe to it, you have to uh, already provide an email address. Let me go to the, to the next step. 
because once you better know the brand, you might, you do might uh, want to share some information in order to get a better service. Think, for example, about uh, sharing uh, preferences or, or certain habits, um, but also interactions with other shops. For example, you can informa- you can use information from uh, previous purchases done at, at store A to find complementary products at store B. Um, and this brings us to the to the next step. And that's personalization, because from a brand's perspective, we also want to enable them to optimize experience with the information that a visitor is willing to share. And based on the level of trust, customers will be more inclined to share more information. Of course, they have to understand that in return, they get uh, more value. Uh, and they uh, have to know that they always stay in control over their data. And we foresee that this is how brands will compete uh, with each other. So it will not be about who has the most data, but it, it will become about who can best read the information that the customer brings uh, to us. So, so far, we've been talking about the, the one-on-one experience between brand and customer. But B2B also enables interacting with, with multiple brands from a user-controlled environment. And in my opinion, this is the, the most interesting part about this new scenario. So what does this look like? Uh, it starts with, with managing brands. Like, unlike what we are used to now, where our information lives with each individual shop and service we use, in this new situation, the information is controlled in one's own environment. So you can see what information is shared with who. But you can also uh, update your, your principles, and it can be shared across all brands uh, uh, from the single touchpoint. For example, um, if you move to a new address, you only have to update it in your pod, and it can be shared to all the connected brands. But it also enables a new uh, search experience. And we see two different uh, search experiences that, that can complement each other. And the first one is with the shop directly. So similar as you would with the shop survey. Uh, the difference, however, is that now you can bring your own own information and, and make it available or readable to the shop. And as this information is much richer, the experience, the experience can be uh, much better. And the second experience is within the pod, because as all brands connect to the user in the central space, you can now make their catalogs uh, searchable in this uh, one place as well. And this uh, should sound familiar because this is exactly what a marketplace like, like Amazon does. However, instead of having the marketplace acting as a middleman, uh, the customer now becomes uh, his own marketplace. But in this marketplace, it, it only contains the, the brands that the user trusts and enjoys, and, and it allows for brands to, to still own the experiment, uh, experience. And finally, as the user is always in control, the user can always decide to, to disconnect from a brand and, and end the relationship. And that almost brings us to the end of this uh, presentation because um, it, it, in the end, it, it all, um, it, it, it's all about creating uh, value. And, and I hope that this presentation helped to understand that, that how in this changing world where less data becomes available, that it will not automatically lead to a situation where we can create less experience, uh, lesser experiences. I think it's it's rather the contrary. If, if we embrace it, uh, much more will be possible than is uh, possible today. Um, and as I said, in the end, it's 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 all about creating uh, value. And 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 me to be cannot succeed if the value it brings is isn't greater than what is already out there today. So that's why we continue to explore these new possibilities and we do this together with our partners and with clients because we see that by working together we can best learn and understand um, how this future can be created. So as you might understand, we are very excited about uh, this future. Um, it's a future where privacy and decentralization are key, but in our opinion, they're never a goal in itself. These are merely concepts that, that help us to create better user experiences and to create more value for our customers. Um, and on that note, I would like to end this presentation. So are there any questions? 
Hi, Peter. Yeah, thank you for that presentation. It was um, really good. Um, there was some chat on the side, and we have a couple of questions for you, which I will um, ask you now. So the first one is, um, the outstanding question is, where would users' data live? Storage is not free, and local storage is limited to a particular device, isn't it? If an organization offers free storage for personal preferences, I wonder if there are hidden interests now or in the future. Um, what do you think of that? Yeah, uh, that, that's a good question. And um, it, it's indeed something that, that I left open this uh, presentation because I think there are um, multiple answers to this. Um, and I think in the end, it, it's up to the user's uh, preference on where this data can live. But one, because uh, this, this is something that, 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 that we've been thinking about uh, a lot. Um, as, as a customer, you don't, you're not used to, to um, pay for an account. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I think there's a great opportunity in, in uh, uh, partnerships, for example, uh, with banks, because they already, um, um, uh, how do you say it? store your, your money, so why couldn't they also store your data for you? And, and of course, you, you, you trust, or at least I suppose you trust yeah, your bank. So they, they could be an interesting uh, party. And, and it, it wouldn't be in their interest then to, to sell or, or, or reuse your data with, without your consent, because, um, mm -hmm. yeah, that, that would then hurt the trust that you have uh, with them. But, um, as I said in the presentation, it, it, it can be, uh, this, this is still open. It, it, it can be local storage. It, it can be on your phone, um, but yeah. So <laughs> I hope this- Okay, yeah, great. Um, let me read the, the next question for you. Um, are you suggesting that these pods act as uh, a local storage by uh, on the cloud where each owner is the administrator? Does that make um, of the brands a kind of pod provider? with less rights over these pods? The brands, um, I think brands could be a provider, but not uh, necessarily. Um, they Rather, they are the ones that get access to the pods, but they don't need to be a provider themselves. They, they should be able to read the, 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 the spots. And uh, this is also what, what we are, are um, are, are building or are, are prototyping with, like giving the, the, the brands the tools to to read the information from the from these parts without the need of uh, storing the data uh, themselves. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. Um, and we have another question: um, Is what um, iOS 15 is doing with voice similar to this, um, running and resolving voice locally? Yeah, I, th I think this is this is a very interesting uh, development, uh, which which is very much in line with, with the thinking behind uh, uh, me to be, where also where you don't just um, uh, store the data in the pod, but you also process it, and you only only share the result with with the other party. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely in line with, with this uh, thinking. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. And uh, we have another question. Um, do you see big tech providers, uh, for example, Apple or Google, turning into pod providers, uh, creating their own shopping app in iOS and Android? I, I think this is definitely uh, a possibility that, that this will happen. Um, I think looking at, at, at Apple, and Google today, I, I think it, it's more in line with, 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 with Apple's way of thinking and, and, and like protecting the, the, the customer's data. But I wouldn't be surprised if, if, if Google is, uh, would also go in, in, into this direction. But yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't know. Uh, I, wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't exclude these, these options at all. They, they might be able to become a partner. You never know, yeah. yeah. Um, I guess, yeah, um, one uh, question I had. So if people want to um, 
like following your footsteps and look into this stuff. Um, do you have any recommendations for like resources or places to check out or people to get in contact with? Just where can people learn more about this kind of stuff? Yeah. Um, well, they can always contact me or our uh, company, but uh, personally, uh, or personally, at Empty, we, we work a lot with, with Solids. We have, um, it, it's open source. They have lots of uh, great resources. They have every month, they have the Solid World where uh, Tim Berners Lee uh, hosts a, a talk and they, they talk about the latest developments. Um, there's also the My Data organization, which has uh, lots of great uh, content and some white papers on this on this topic. Um, yeah, I, I have to look into that. So, for the one who has a discussion, just please uh, send an email, or uh, and I will. Uh, I'm glad to help you. Uh, okay, with this, great. Uh, and we've had another question come through. Um, so with more personalized search um, also potentially comes um, tunnel bias. Have you thought about how you decrease this sort of bias? You mean that, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's a good question. Um, I think that this is already happening as well in, 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 in a conventional way of, 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 of doing things. But um, yeah, it's a, it's a good question. I have to think about it. One, one answer, I think, is that this approach allows the, the brands to each can interpret the data in their own way. So if, for example, you have two, uh, two brands that, that, sell, that sell the shoes. They see the same information, but they can interpret it in a, in a different way. Mm -hmm. So I, th I think that's what it, it's not a solution to this because uh, this is more like the, the, the tunnel bias from, from the customer's perspective. But uh, yeah, no, good question. Uh, I have to think about it.